Hey everybody, it is late at night and I am Norman. This is a really depressing video to have to make. Doing my write-up of it was really, really sad. Tonight we're talking about the fall of Wittenauer. I recently purchased a brilliant vintage gold Wittenauer watch and I actually got it for under $100. And it's absolutely gorgeous. And it really is an example of top-notch watch design. However, every time I posted it, I always kind of second-guessed my spelling on the name. So the other day I was pulling it up just to double check and I saw the Wittenauer website and I clicked on it. Big mistake. So tonight we'll go over a little bit of the history of Wittenauer and look at some of their pieces that they were producing in the past and then we'll look at what I found on their website today. So be sure to stick around to see those. The company was founded by a Swiss immigrant named Albert Wittenauer. He came to New York in 1872. He had a brother-in-law named Eugene Robert, and he was actually in the watch industry. Eugene was an importer of high-end watches. He sold watches from the likes of Longines, J.J. LeCoultre, and Vacheron Constantin. Business was booming, so he decided to hire Albert to help out a bit. At that point in time, Albert was only 16 years old. And even at such a young age, Albert was a skilled watchmaker. And Albert identified a need in America for durable, affordable watches. His goal was to create high quality watches without the high price tag. By 1880, he had actually founded his own company and named it after himself, A. Wittenauer. And during that year, the company produced its first line of watches. And Wittenauer as a company was truly a family affair. He hired two of his brothers and two other family members, Louis and Emil, came over to America from Switzerland and he hired them as well. He hired a brilliant watchmaker named Ferdinand Hoschka. Hoschka was from the Glasuta School of Watchmaking and he would eventually become the head of the watches department at Tiffany & Co. Tragedy struck the family and Louise, their brother, died, leaving only Albert and Emile to run the business. When Albert died in 1908, Emile took the reins of the company. Tragedy would continue to haunt the family. Around 1915, Emile was dead, all the Wittenauer brothers were dead, leaving only their sister Martha to run the company. She later became the first woman to be inducted into the Horological Society of America. And she didn't even have any formal business training, yet she was able to head the company for over 20 years. In the early 1900s, the company was in its prime. A Wittenauer watch was worn on the Gemini 8 mission, and instruments that they created were utilized by Amelia Earhart in her solo flight. Wittenauer was actually considered for the first flight to the moon, but someone else was chosen. The Great Depression brought turmoil to the brand, and we see one of many changes in ownership at this time. Due to the financial strain, Martha sold the company to a pearl manufacturer, and it was later paired up with Longines. However, both watch lines were kept distinct. In 1969, the Westinghouse Electric Company purchased Wittenauer. And in the 1970s, it was extremely successful with the electric watches that it was designing and producing. In 1983, Wittenauer joined the Swatch Group. In 1996, Bulova and Movado attempted to acquire the company, but were outbid. Later on, Bulova was able to successfully take the company, and it is now part of Bulova's family of watch brands, which consists of Bulova, Wittenauer, Accutron, and Caravelle. However, when I look at Wittenauer's website, I feel like I punched in the wrong URL. Let's look at some of Wittenauer's historical pieces. The Wittenauer All Proof. The All Proof was a watch designed to be tough enough to handle whatever was thrown at it. The diminutive watch at a mere 27 millimeters was touted as being waterproof, shockproof, anti-magnetic, dustproof. This was the watch of choice by Jimmy Mattern, who had attempted to circumnavigate the globe by airplane. 
He actually wrote about this watch. It gives me great pleasure to advise you that my Wittenauer Allproof watch was my only constant companion in my round-the-world solo flight, and it survived all hardships. It is a crash-proof timepiece par excellence. After my plane crashed, I had to wade and swim in some of the rivers. It proved absolutely waterproof. It kept up a true performance when I was lost to civilization for many days. It was a sensation with the Eskimos who considered it something supernatural. It personifies mechanical perfection heretofore unknown to me. And when I reached New York, it was correct to the minute. I banged it all around. It was dropped on concrete a number of times. Still, it keeps ticking away. I should not have believed that such a watch could be built. But my experience has shown me that too much cannot be said about this wonderful all-proof timepiece, which I recommend for hard usage. And just look at these brilliant dress watches that the brand was producing in the 1960s. And they produced amazing chronographs and super compressors. And let's look at Wittenauer today. The WN3100 Men's Black Tie Watch. This retails for about $450. This is a watch that can only be described as having a fashion watch aesthetic. It looks like a piece that one would find on Wish, yet it comes with a hefty price tag at nearly $500. It does have a sapphire crystal, which is great. However, judging by the name, I'm guessing they're going for a dressy watch. This watch has a 44 millimeter case size. It has stick hands and the dial is sterile except for the brand name below the 12 o'clock. There are markers at the 12, 3, 6, and 9. These markers are diamonds, which explains the price. There is no mention on the site what movement is in these watches or how wide the lugs are. I'm guessing they're 22 millimeters given the case size. The hands look like they're actually designed for a 40 millimeter watch. They are very short and really add to the poor looking design of this piece. In fact, look at this $5 Wish watch. It has a similar design to its dial. While the Wittenauer may have real diamonds for markers, it looks just as bad as this $5 piece. In fact, the Wish watch did a better job with its hands. The WN3095 Men's Marquee Watch which retails for $675. With the marquee line, they took all the poor design choices of the black tie and actually made them even worse. The case is even larger at 45 millimeters. There are still diamonds for markers. However, now they're cut into triangle shapes, which actually looks worse. And the crystal is faceted around the edge to look like a gemstone of some sort. I feel like the gold tone hands make it look cheaper not more luxurious. I do kind of like the lines on the dial, but that doesn't negate everything that's wrong with this watch. Again, if we go to Wish, we can find a $6 watch that's actually doing something very similar with its 12 o'clock jewel marker. The WN3097 Men's Montserrat watch, which retails for about $525. With this watch, they reined in the case size to 41, which is good. But look at how oversized the Roman numeral is at the 12 o'clock. And it isn't at all elegant looking. And they felt the need to ruin it with yet more diamonds at the 3, 6, and 9 o'clock positions. And that date window. Not only does its background not match the dial, but it's floating way inside of the 3 o'clock marker. If you're paying over $500 for a watch, shouldn't it have a date window that actually looks like part of the watch's design? Maybe a matching background? And why not give it a nice metal frame? And again, for over $500, shouldn't we at least get to know what's inside the watch? At least the bracelet looks good on this piece. The WN3075 Men's Laureate Watch. This retails for $750. And the WN3078 Men's Watch, which retails for about $895. Even when Wittenauer is onto something design-wise, they completely ruin it. Take the Laureate, for example. This could have been a brilliant-looking tank-style dress watch, but it's pretty large for a tank watch at 30 meters wide, 
and I'm not sure how thick it really is. Something tells me it isn't really 76.8 millimeters. The dial looks great. The markers are nice looking stick markers with Arabics at the 12 and 6 o'clock. The hands are simple stick hands that work well with the design. There's no clashing date window and the length of the hands look fine. But the bracelet looks like something out of the 1990s. Why not give it a dressy leather strap? The watch is 30 millimeters wide. How wide is this bracelet? And it looks like it doesn't taper at all. And the watch is completely crusted with diamonds. And for this, you're paying over $700. At that price, you have plenty of other tank style watches to choose from that are actually elegant pieces. The watch that is called simply a men's watch is a chronograph at nearly $900. It's 42 millimeters. The dial looks pretty good, like the Laureate. The hands are great and the subdials look really good. But again, we have the same hideous bracelet. And again, this piece is completely covered in diamonds. Why? Why does every single piece have to be completely covered in diamonds? Who is sitting at the design table, Wittenauer? Who does Wittenauer have coming up with these designs? This brand has gone from being a contender for moon missions and solo flights around the globe to being wish-looking fashion watches and being sold at retailers like Overstock and Kohl's. Don't get me wrong, I love me some Kohl's affordable clothing, but yeah. And freaking QVC. Does no one at Wittenauer think that maybe a course correction is warranted? I hate that I made the mistake of clicking on their website. That makes me so sad to see such a brilliant brand reduced to absolute rubbish. Just, it's sad. It's actually a little bit depressing to look at their old pieces and their new ones and to think that that is the same brand at least in name. <sighs> Thanks for watching.